Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Great in the sight of the Lord. be with you. Let us pray. God of truth and sacrifice, we give thanks for your servant William Alexander Gary, who, like the church's first martyr, gave witness to your liberating gospel and echoed Christ's healing words of forgiveness. May we also seek your truth as we offer ourselves in obedience to the same. All this we pray through him who is forever the bishop and reformer of our souls, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities the devastations of many generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. When they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed from the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. But even the hairs of your head are all counted. Do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, Everyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man, also will acknowledge before the angels of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier. Amen. Amen. 
I want to thank Dean Wright for asking me to be with you today on the feast day of South Carolina reformer and martyr, William Alexander Gary. Today we remember and honor a native son of South Carolina who believed that all God's children should be ministered unto, regardless of local laws and customs, who was unflinching in his beliefs, who tried, alas, unsuccessfully to persuade his fellow Episcopalians at that time to change their minds, but who as bishop, in terms of the way people count dioceses in history, statistics, the diocese under his care, the members, the finance, governance, etc., he clearly was one of the most successful bishops in the Episcopal Church in South Carolina in the 20th century and probably the American South. In 1928, the year of his murder, and I think, yes, let's call it what it was, Bishop Gary was murdered. He did not simply fall asleep in death, as the newspaper said. In 1928, the year of his death, despite the division in the diocese, the membership was back to what it had been when he first assumed the mantle in 1908. He had reformed diocesan governance to bring it into not just the 19th century, but the 20th century. And believe it or not, because most bishops don't have this reputation, he was known as being among the few great preachers of the Episcopal Church. Yet, within a few years, William Alexander Gary was a forgotten man. And also forgotten was how he died. Why? Bishop Gary's progressivism was well known around the state and certainly in church circles. And I'm quoting now. While always loyal to the faith of the church, wrote the editor of the diocese, his mind was open. He always looked to modern developments of thought, not only without fear, but with hope that through them would come a deepening understanding of a revealed religion. And he always stood for progress when he was convinced that any proposition gave promise of some betterment or development in the life of church or society, he could be, accounted, he could be counted upon to espouse it with all his strength. That's true, but, and it is a very big but, in South Carolina and the Episcopal Church in this state, this diocese, but I would say the state as well, in the first quarter of the 20th century, there were certain ideas about progress that were taboo. Since 1706, when South Carolina first had a black majority population, the vexing issue of race was the 800-pound gorilla or elephant in the room, whichever you want to choose, they change today. But whether the topic be politics, business and industry, education, or religion, that elephant was there. It was a topic Bishop Gary did not shy away from. In his 1910 address to the council, he em emphasized the unity of the church of all peoples. And at the following council in 1911, he spoke at length upon the subject of the Episcopal supervision of the church among the Negroes. He favored the election of a black suffragan bishop in the Diocese of South Carolina to minister solely to black Episcopalians. A committee was appointed to consider the plan and report to the next council. And Albert Sidney Thomas's history of the diocese is the following. For a year, there was much agitation in the diocese over the question. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if there ever were an understatement, <laughs> that is it. In 1912, after a year discussion, the bishop again set forth in strong terms his approval of the suffragan plan. A committee that he had appointed, the majority recommended it, but the resolution in council did not resolve that this council is not in favor of the election of a Negro suffragan bishop at this time. In word and deed, as a proponent of the social gospel, Bishop Gary reflected very much the spirit of today's Old Testament lesson from Isaiah, who was called to reach out to the poor, the brokenhearted, 
the captives, the prisoners, to the other of his world. And that is what Bishop Geary did. He certainly reached out to those that Isaiah mentioned, but he also did his best to reach out to the true other of his world, that is the South Carolina of the 1920s. And that was the African American population. Interestingly, during the first part of Bishop Geary's Episcopate, South Carolina enjoyed a period of relative progressivism, at least in terms of civic and community improvement, public health, and even in politics. But the state's progressivism was for whites only. After World War I, things did not remain quite the same. Black Carolinians who had supported the war effort and fought to make the world safe for democracy were bitterly disappointed when they came home. In 1919, there was a statewide convention of African Americans that met in Columbia to protest against voting barriers and segregation that asked for better schools and rep representation on school boards. And in May 1919, there was a race riot here in Charleston that left three black Charlestonians dead. There were fears across the state that there might be trouble elsewhere. The summer of 1919 was a tense one in South Carolina. The 1920s saw the rise of the Ku Klux Klan across the state. Now the Klan was against everything it deemed not 100% American. In, South, in the South, and here in South Carolina, that meant Jews, Roman Catholics, and African Americans. The General Assembly, for example, ousted long-term USC donor and alumnus August Cohen from the Board of Trustees because he was Jewish. In Florence and Greenville, there were clear indications that local law enforcement and the Klan were in cahoots. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, John K. Hamblin from Union County, hosted a barbecue for members of the General Assembly at Klan headquarters in Columbia. Now, while respectable whites might disparage the Klan, many shared its views of African Americans. Congressman James F. Burns, who by the way refused to join the Klan and it cost him an election, said in 1919 during that tense summer, the war has in no way changed the attitude of the white man toward the social and political equality of the Negro. Bishop Geary's disdain for the Klan was well known. So also was his support for programs such as Voorhees that benefited black Carolinians. James Herbert Woodard, a non-parochial clergyman of the diocese was supportive of the Klan and had expressed his dismay at the bishop's belief in the social gospel. On June the 5th, 1928, he met with Bishop Geary in his office the priest then shot the bishop and turned the gun on himself. Bishop Geary lingered for four painful days but died of his wounds on June the 9th. The death of the bishop was national news, but after initial coverage, it was as if a, a switch had been flipped. Silence. Local knowledge about the murder of his clan associations and his outspoken racist views were not mentioned. Instead, Crawford, when it was mentioned at all, was described as being demented. That, by the way, in 2019, is still the line used in Gary's biography in an Episcopal, Episcopal Dictionary of the Church where the murderer is described as a mentally disturbed priest. Charleston and the diocese seem to have collective amnesia about the bishop's death. Why? We don't really know, but there are several suppositions. Was it embarrassment about the murderer's motives, his views, which were shared by all too many of the respectable sort? Was it a PR decision at the time when Charleston tourism was just beginning to bring much needed income into the city? I mean, after all, if a bishop is murdered in his own office, is a New Yorker gonna be safe wandering the streets of as a yet unrehabilitated downtown? Or was it a concern that continued discussion of the tragedy might encourage others to support the bishop's views of the social gospel? That would be a real threat. The result, the story of the right Reverend William Alexander Gary became something akin to a situation described in the hymn in honor of our ancestors from Ecclesiasticus chapter 44. 
Let us now sing the praises of famous men, our ancestors and their generations. The Lord appointed to them great glory, his majesty from the beginning. All these were honored in their generations and were the pride of their times. Some of them have left behind a name so that others must declare their praise. But of others, there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. Now, after decades of silence, the name of William Alexander Gary will live on from generation to generation because, as the writer of Ecclesiastica said, the assembly has declared his wisdom and the congregation proclaims his praise. Amen. our voices with all creation and all the saints of every time and place. Let us offer our prayers to God, saying, In your mercy, hear us, Lord. For the Holy Church of God throughout the world, remembering Skip, our bishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, and Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and remembering Voorhees College, and the United Church of North India in the Anglican Communion, that the Lord may confirm the church in faith, sustain it in hope, and deepen its communion in charity. In your mercy. For the leaders of all nations and peoples, that there may be mercy, justice, and peace throughout the world. In your mercy. For this city, in every place, for ourselves, our families, and companions, and for all those we love. In your mercy. Hear us, Lord. For all those in danger, those who are hungry and homeless, those who are beaten, oppressed, and imprisoned, that the example of the saints may give them courage and the help of believers give them hope. In your mercy. Yes, Lord. For all who serve at home or overseas in the military or in mission or outreach work, 
and their families, remembering George, Keen, Andrew, Tim, Bob, Joseph, John, Christian, Jake, Patrick, Drew, George, John Henry, and Edward. For all youth and volunteers during Grace Youth Week. In thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life, for the students, volunteers, and organizers of Grace Church Cathedral's Vacation Bible School. In your mercy. In your for all those who are ill or suffering hardship, especially Paula, Colin, Billy, Eason, Mary, Jeff, Rhett, Bratton, James, Sherry, Shannon, Pooh, Carolyn, Elizabeth, Vance, Missy, Betty, Carl, Igor, Fred, Josie, Jean, Louise, and Anne. For the dying and the dead and all who mourn, remembering Bishop William Alexander Gary, Mary Frances Anderson Went, Suzanne Schofield, Ronald Bryant, Quinya McCoy, John Schaefer, Harry Nelson, Sean Houston, and Hay Sparks. In your mercy. Yes, Lord. Holy God, mighty God, immortal God, adored by martyrs and praised by the saints, receive the prayers of your holy church and grant them in accordance with your gracious will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bishop Gary Sunday. Do uh, join us in Hanahan Hall following our service for a time of refreshment and fellowship together. Um, all I can say, Walter, is welcome home to Grace Church Cathedral. What a gift it is to have you here. How do we say thank you for all that uh, you've done for us? Well. Um, we have a little idea about that, because in 2017, we established at Grace Church Cathedral an award given in honor of the 8th Bishop of the Diocese of South Carolina, the Right Reverend William Alexander Gary, Bishop, Reformer, and Martyr. Uh, the award, the Bishop Gary Medal, is presented annually to individuals who best ex exemplify the spirit of sacrifice that Bishop Gary modeled in his life and witness as the Bishop of South Carolina. And as you know, our own chapel at the back of the church is named for the martyred bishop. Uh, in keeping with the uncovering and retelling of Bishop Gary's story, we honor today someone who has spent his life searching out and retelling stories of those 
whose stories would otherwise go untold. And I think Bishop Gary would approve. And that's why today we present the Bishop Gary Mental to Walter Edgar. Thank you. Right here. Stay there. I'm going to invite two other recipients in past years, our chancellor, our sub-dean, to come together for a picture, uh, after a word, of course. I'd like to invite the wardens up. Uh, the wardens have a special announcement, unbeknownst to the dean, that is, they have a special announcement, which is a first. Wait a second here. Barry just said he's not in charge of everything. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Professor Edgar. Um, we recognize that the Bishop Gary Award is the Dean's Award, Medal to Award, but we are usurping that right to present this medal on behalf of the wardens, vestry, clergy, and the people of Grace Church. The significance of this award would not be complete without this Dean being among the recipients. Wow. The award the awards states, from the creation of the Gary Chapel to yearly observances at Grace Church Cathedral, as well as his writing of both a collect and a hymn in recognition of Bishop Gary, Dean Michael Wright has etched the martyr's story into the hearts of God's faithful people all the way from Charleston to Canterbury. As the Dean's hymn states, the martyr's song still sings. Thank you. We've got Charlie up here. And the warden. Got to get the warden in. Thank you. Smile and say sneaky. Thank you. Congratulations. I finally made the grade. Thank you. What other tricks have you planned? Well, believe it or not, I'm somewhat speechless. With the emphasis on somewhat. I better end it here. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all your saints, who have been the chosen vessels of your grace and the light of the world in their generation. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. And the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he'd given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. We offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, O gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ, and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that heavenly country where with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed William Alexander Gary, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven.
gifts of God for the people of God.
In the name of God, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. Amen. Together we pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, Go in peace, and may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>